Scientists may have found a way to predict how long you will live. Police forces in the UK predict crimes that might happen before they take place. What you're basically saying is a 60% chance that Republicans win the Senate. That's right. When it comes to delivering packages, an item could be sent out before you even buy it on the Amazon site. Welcome, everybody. I'm Ira Plato. Thank you. As you can tell from the presentation, this, uh, this little meeting is about predicting the future. You saw all the things that we can predict now. This is an age of prediction. People are trying to predict everything that you do, who you're going to date, who you, what you're going to buy, how long you're going to live. We know something about it from your genetic code, what kind of consumer you are, What's the weather going to be like? What's the future going to be like? We're going to talk about all those ideas, and especially given that prediction. And uh, How do they collect all this data that they know all of this? Do you feel that your privacy is being invaded every time you go on you know, Tumblr or Hulu or any of those kind of places, and people collect this stuff about you so they can make predictions about what you're going to be doing, where you're going to be shopping? So we're going to talk about the future. What kind of big math is used? Do we need quantum computers to help us collect all of this data that the NSA probably has already for you? Uh, so <laughs> that, that's what we'll be talking about. Let me, let me have a seat and introduce our panel of guests who are really good, and they're studying all of this stuff. Let me introduce them to you. He's a professor of political science and medical genetics at the University of California, San Diego and a 2010 fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. His research has been cited more than 10,000 times, and his acclaimed book, Connected, has been published in 20 languages, James Fowler. Let's see you, Jim. Let's see you. He's a professor at the MIT Sloan School of Management, director of MIT's Laboratory for Financial Engineering, a principal investigator at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, and is in authority on hedge funds and financial engineering. And he proposed applying evolution to financial markets. We'll see how that's worked out. Andrew W. Lowe, welcome. <laughs> he is currently the professor of quantum mechanical engineering at MIT and director of the Keck Center for Extreme Quantum Information Theory. He is the first person to develop a realizable model for quantum computation. His research focuses on the role of information in a complex system and the quantum mechanics of living systems known as quantum life. Quantum life, I'll have to get into that. Economics and cosmology, Seth Lloyd. <laughs> he is the Jacob Gould Sherman Professor of Applied Mathematics at Cornell University. He's the author of Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos Sync and the Calculus of Friendship. His latest book is The Joy of X. <laughs> Stephen Strogatz, welcome. Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> How many of you, uh, ever, uh, uh, would it be safe to assume that everybody here posts uh, tweets, they have a Facebook account, you're on Tumblr? Raise your hands if, if you're, uh, you're into a lot of these things. Okay, well, uh, James Fowler believes that if you drill into all of those posts, tweets, and I think they're called pins, <laughs> uh, you can predict a lot about us. Tell us, tell us uh, let's start with the data. How much data is there out there to collect from everybody? 
Well, it's crazy. Yeah, we were trying to collect data on Twitter ourselves. We're only getting 1% of it a day. Um, and we're filling up the maximum hard drive that we have now at about once a month. Um, and so, so this is going to be multiple hard drives, multiple computers over the course of just a year. And that's just Twitter. Uh, Twitter is just 140 characters at a time. You go to something like Facebook, where you have all this rich information about pictures and videos and social interactions, it gets, gets even larger. Mm -hmm. And so why, why limit it? To, is this Twitter enough to tell you what you need to know? Yeah, well, what any, do you learn from all that? Well, any data is, is good data. I, and you know, I like to talk about this in terms of the power of friends. Um, really, friends can be used in four different ways to predict the future. First of all, your friends are data in that what they do, you are also more likely to do. We've seen this through a number of different studies. Um, if they're obese, you're more likely to be obese. If they smoke, you're more likely to smoke. If they're liberal, you're more likely to be liberal. On all these different connections, we can predict something about you by knowing something about your friends. We also know that friends influence one another. And so at least some of the reason why you and your friends are similar is because you can change your friends' minds in a way that a stranger can't. We also know that friends are multiplier effects, so that if I can just count up the total number of friends you have, that's one way for me to figure out what's happening with you. You're connected to hundreds of people online, and so if you make one change, it's possible that's going to change dozens, and in some cases, hundreds of people that you don't even know. And then the last thing is that friends can be used to predict epidemics, and the way that we can do this is by looking for the people who are most connected in these online social networks in order to find out what they're doing, because they usually tend to do these things first when something is spreading through a network. And does it have to be my direct friend, or could it skip my friend of a friend, and you know what's what they're doing? Well, that's, that's the really fascinating thing, is that sometimes we're finding that it's easier for us to predict things about you by looking at your friend's data and your friend's friend's data than it is your own data. And the reason why is because even though their data is lower quality, it's much higher quantity. You know, you'll, you'll scale up to hundreds of friends. That means you're scaling up to tens of thousands of friends of friends. You have all that information that's going to guide you to figure out what kind of person you are. And you can, you can predict, actually, this, you mentioned the spread of epidemics. Has that, that actually been proven successful? Yeah, so we have a couple of, of implementations, one in a real-world social network where we showed that, that certain people, if you select them from a real-world face-to-face social network, people who are your friends, because they're more popular, they tend to get the flu before you do, up to two weeks in advance. These people are central throughout the network. <laughs> and um, we've done this on Twitter now to predict what's going to go viral, um, which hashtags are going to go viral. And in, in that case, you can get sometimes up to two, three months advance warning on the things that are going to get the most retweets and the most mentions on, on, on Facebook, hmm. I mean, on, on Twitter. Can, can I influence what my friends do by, if I say I'm going to take a diet, I'm going on a diet, I want to lose weight. Does that radiate out into my friend's community, let's say, on Twitter? If I tweet, I'm, you know, I'm going on some sort of diet today. Yes, and so we've seen correlation between you and your friends and your friend's friends and even your friend's friend's friends in these networks. And there have been experimental studies that show that when you make a change, that it actually affects the people that you're directly connected to. So at least some of the reason why you and your friend's friend's friends are the same is because of this influence that's propagating through the network. Hmm. Uh, can you influence who they're going to vote for by saying, I'm going to vote for this person? Yes. Um, now, we have not studied that explicitly, but we did do a 60 million person experiment on Facebook in the 2010 election. How many of you might have logged in on election day in 2010 onto Facebook? Raise your hand. So you were members of this experiment. Um, and we showed some. <laughs> that's right. Thank you very much. Um, we showed some did, did, they, did you know you were members of that experiment? <laughs> we can talk about ethics later if you want. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> So, um, so we showed some people a message and didn't show other people the message, and it was random. So there was nothing about you that was correlated with whether or not you got the message. And the people who saw the message voted more in real life, because we matched it to publicly available voter registration records, and their friends voted more. But what if, what if I don't have any Facebook friends? You know, I'm one of those few people who didn't do anything. Am, am I left out of this? Am I, can, uh, is the data bad because you're only taking people who tweet or have Facebook friends? So first of all, more than 60% of Americans who are adults are active on Facebook. So this has really penetrated um, people at all ages. And if anything, usage is somewhat higher in older people now because um, teenagers have figured out that, that all their moms and dads are there, so they don't use it as much. When they go to college, they, they tend to get back onto it. But, but there's a lot of people there. And we know that Facebook users are a little bit different in some ways. They tend to be a little bit more extroverted, maybe a little more concerned about privacy. But by and large, they tend to look a lot like the population as a whole. Mm -hmm. So what else? Besides, what things would you like to predict that we're going to see everybody being crowdsourced, 
What things would you like to predict that you can't predict at this point? Well, um, I would love to use the social data to predict how long we're going to live. Um, you can do that? Uh, we're working on it. How? <laughs> With how much accuracy? That's the open question. But it looks like so far in our early trials, it looks like we're going to be able to get at least as much accuracy from the friend data as we are from your own data. Because if you tell people that, they're going to start worrying, right? Like, well, hopefully. I see you're shaking your head. You're all shaking your heads <laughs> on this, right? I mean, could you say, James, is the idea that if you, if your friends live long, you live long? Is that how it, you think it's going to go, yeah, so or the, what? There are specific mechanisms as well, right? So um, we have information about cause of death in, in some cases, and so we can we can not only sort of partition out how long you're going to live, but what you're likely to to die of. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can imagine that, you know. There's all kinds of behaviors that are correlated networks because we choose friends who are like us and because we influence them. And so there's information in those friends about things that could lead to your death, like drinking behavior, like obesity, you know, these, these causes of death that are, are very prevalent. All right. Well, get, do you want to jump in there? Well, I was going to say that, that if you have lots of enemies, you might die sooner. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not friending them? <laughs> you you unfriended friend, them? I don't friend my frenemies? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, let's, let's talk, Seth, Seth Lloyd, let's talk about what's behind all of this. You hear uh, a lot of these days about big data and machine learning. What are they? What is their role in, in, in this revolution in, in prediction? What's so, um, as James was saying, we are collecting vast quantities of data. Um, a, a data set that, um, that uh, I can imagine might even be available sometime in the next few decades. You imagine the, um, the information about the entire genome of every human being on the planet. So there, you know, there will soon be, there'll be roughly, when this happens, around 10 billion people. It's all in the order of 10 billion bits of information per, per uh, genome, so this is, 20 billion bits. It's actually more information than you could store on the hard drives of <laughs> all the computers on the planet. But we'll get to that there soon. Which is the technical definition of big data. That That's data right. One computer, That's right. right so. so now this would be an amazingly useful and potentially very productive data set to you know, identify possible genetic diseases of people, um, to look at, at uh, uh, be able to you know, trace, trace your ancestry and trace relationships between people. On the other hand, it would also be a data set where I'm not sure I would want my insurance company to uh, know what was in my piece of it. So you, can, you have these gigantic amounts of data that are there, that are already out there and that we're acquiring, and they potentially have a great deal of use, not merely to try to sell people stuff, you know. But uh, uh, the, uh, so uh, big data is, by definition, these very large amounts of data. And it's far too much information for individual people just to look at and try to understand. So people like James are making techniques to parse through this data and via computers and learn what's there. So that's machine learning, when, when machines learn what is in this data. You know, the problem's actually going to be even bigger because increasingly we are learning that we are influenced not just by our own genes, but the genes of the organisms that live within us, the, the microbiome. Um, and that's going to be, you know, another order of magnitude that we're going to have to deal with. I'm going to pay to sequence my DNA first and then my E. coli's okay, DNA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but 23 90, billion in me. Right? But 90% right. <laughs> 90, 90 of the DNA in your body doesn't belong to you. Well, it depends what you mean by belong. I right. mean, it's living in there. It belongs to all the trillions of cells, of the other bacteria and viruses. I understand. I, I feel I possess the contents of my gut, but maybe we feel differently <laughs> about it. <laughs> <laughs> in, 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 in terms of, of, of math, Steve Strogatz, uh, how revolutionary is, is, do we need new tools, have we got everything we need or, uh, to, to analyze all this data and make these predictions, or are we trying to figure out um, how much more we need? I, mean, I, I feel like from the math side, we're way behind on this, uh, that when I hear you know, a reference to machine learning, um, the machines may detect patterns and correlations. They do. Machine learning is this impressive technique in computer science. But very often, after it predicts correctly certain correlations, it's very hard for the human beings looking at that to see what exactly was found. And I'm, I'm a little bit reminded of um, the days of epicycles, you know, a long time ago when Ptolemy was the great astronomer trying to figure out how the planets move. And he... Uh, 
And earlier, astronomers had this theory about the planets moving in perfect circles that were orbiting on perfect circles. So you had these circles on top of circles, and it gave actually very good account of planetary motions, except today we don't think that it's the right theory. And so I, I sort of wonder if we might be, through machine learning, building epicycle models of, of big data. That is where, what I'm trying to say is, seeing patterns is not the same as understanding. You don't know what those patterns is that mean. What machine learning is a machine learn. Does the machine learn the pattern? Or does it it's, look for the pattern? It's looking for the pattern. It's also a machine teaching. I mean, it's telling us what it's found. But it, it's, you know, roughly speaking, it's it's um, you feed it a bunch of things to look for, and it then sort of shows you which of those have the most predictive power, or which combinations of them have the most predictive power. And sometimes you could take a sort of agnostic approach where you just throw in like all kinds of statistical things that you don't even know what they would mean just to ask it, should I weight that heavily or not? And, and it often returns peculiar things that are hard to interpret. Sometimes though, they're very transparent and you suddenly realize, uh, like it can actually show you something. It can sift the gold out of the, you can know, out of the dirt. something you weren't looking for? Yes. Like, give me an example of something like that. Yeah, that well, I think there was a case recently of um, a study of Facebook done by my colleague John Kleinberg and, and his um, former student, Lars Backstrom, who now works at, at Facebook. Maybe James knows his study better. Yeah. About, um, so let's see, they're looking at couples, and that is, people who are married, and then you also look at, or me, I don't even know if you have to be married. Is it just with spouses, or could it be your significant other? But the idea is, so each of us, that is me and my significant other on Facebook, we each have our friends. And then the question is something about how do those friends tie to each other? Are they, like, am, are they tied directly to each other? Or do they only know each other through us, through this couple? And then the question is, given the structure of this pair friendship network, what does that say about the stability of our relationship? Are we likely to get divorced or not based on the topology of our network? That might sound like a crazy question to ask, and it turns out that there's actually really serious predictive power in that. Yeah, the, the, the do you first, want to finish the yeah, sentence? Yeah, yeah the, the, it's the, the very first interesting. Order is, the first order thing you're trying to do is, is give me your Facebook data, and what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to guess who your boyfriend or your girlfriend is without any self-declaration, just mean, looking at the structure of the network. Facebook people in the world? You no, just any, any one person, you're, you're okay. just, you're, just your okay. own network, the people okay. you're directly connected to. And so, so from that, one of the things that they found is that your significant other tends to be connected to all the different communities of people that you're connected to. So you're likely to have introduced them to your childhood friends, your high school friends, your college friends, your work friends, much more so than anyone else in your network. And if you haven't done that, then the second stage was um, you're in trouble. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it makes sense once you hear it. But the, but the, the relevant um, metrics that had to be used to look for this were not things that we in network theory had thought about before. That is, um, Kleinberg and Backstrom had to invent a new concept that they called dispersion that was not a standard network theory tool. But, it, but the machine learning was sort of revealing, you should have thought of this, and once you did, then you're not Ptolemy, then you're Kepler. That is now, you actually have insight into what the data are telling you, the way that Kepler did with Tycho Brahe's data in astronomy. So I feel like what we're looking for is with these machine teachers, um, or machine learning then teaching us, that we can go from being Ptolemy to Kepler, to having real insight into the big data, and not just sort of like listening to the oracle telling us these predictions that turn out right, but we don't know why. So that means all of our privacy is gone, right? Everybody shake their privacy. Privacy Did we ever have privacy? <laughs> I think so. Um, so I, um, I, I actually have this talk that I give um, about, it's called Back to the Village. Um, one of the things that people pointed out in the early days of Facebook was, oh, it's so embarrassing now because I post my pictures on Facebook and oh, I got a little, uh, little drunk last Friday night and before, nobody knew about that because I live in a city and there's a lot of anonymity. But if you think about early village life, life in the ancestral environment, if you made a fool out of yourself one evening, everybody knows about it. So our desire for privacy... But they didn't know about it on the other side of the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we probably don't care about those people. We care about our village. 
Um, and the idea of privacy is itself, I think, an anomaly in human history. It's, it's a, a product of living in cities, which we've only been doing for about 100 years. We're just now getting to the point where a majority of people live in cities. Um, and so I'm, I kind of think what's happening is social media is taking us back to a time where we lived in these communities where there was a lot of awareness about all the things that everyone that we're connected to are doing. Yeah, but we're hearing stories now that with facial recognition coming into a, to full bloom now, that people, wherever they go, that they're going to be recognized as there's capability, you're shaking your head about this, there's capability to somebody to know wherever you are 24 hours a day. And you don't think that's different than loss of privacy than it used to be? I think that every time that we have had a technological innovation where privacy was eroded, there was concern expressed about it. Um, people were very worried about, about this. So that, um, the telephone, like when we, we got the telephone, one of the biggest complaints was men were saying that now all, there were all these dandies in the world that could ply their masculine wiles and steal their wives away from them. Because any stranger in the world could reach in to the home. And you see this exact same kind of concern with sexting and with cyberbullying. You know, bullying is not new. We have always had bullies. You this is just a... about this thing with the telephone? <laughs> <laughs> What's the, what's, the, um, what's the documentation that that, that, was, that that once happened? I mean, it's amazing, that story. Yeah, so we have a citation in our, our book, Connected. I, I, so I someone remember. was writing about it at the time yeah. when telephones were the big new thing? Yeah, and there's also some of this with the telegraph, even, the Victorian Internet. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a book called The Victorian Internet that talks about, about concerns about privacy violations then with the, with the telegraph. So you know, when people were starting to talk, People got really worried about that. People, <laughs> people laughed. Their ideas with people, other people. people it was like very uh, private. People laughed at Bell because they thought it was just a toy. That there's, no, the money, Bell, yeah. that there's uh -huh. no money to be made in people talking to one another. Uh -huh. And they were, it, it, a lot of people could have invented the phone at that time. There were other people, huh. uh, Elijah Gray, people like that. Um, but, when, but it was all about, and this is a good segue to uh, Dr. Lowe, it was all about big business. And what would... <laughs> What would big business do with the phone? And, you know, the same reason the telegraph was, op was invented right. is to send stock market quotes around. Um, how do you, you know, big business, uh, actually it turns out that Bell was wrong. I mean, 150 years ago when the telephone was invented, he bet that people wanted to talk to each other. And they said, no, people want to send documents. No one's going to use the phone. It took 150 years or so to show that texting documents is the way to go because <laughs> no one's using the phone anymore to talk on it. But what way, uh, Dr. Lodo, do, does this big data have to do with, with business? Well, I mean, I think there are a number of different implications. Uh, so first of all, I agree that you know, it's been a tremendous uh, you know, boon to both business uh, you know, and individuals all around to be able to have access to this data. But I think along with big data goes big brother in the sense that now businesses can actually monitor all sorts of activity that have real economic consequences for them and potentially negative consequences for us. So, Seth, you mentioned that you don't necessarily want your insurance company to know about what you're doing, but actually, there are some situations where you might. So, for example, nowadays, some, certain insurance companies are offering discounts if you're willing to allow them to monitor your driving activity. Mm -hmm. This is called the insurance telematics, where if you're willing to let them install a GPS device in your car, uh, and pretty soon it's going to be an iPhone app, where they can monitor not only how you drive, but how fast you drive, how often you drive, where you drive to, if they are monitoring all of those things, they can give discounts to those individuals who are good drivers. The consequence is that they can actually deny insurance to those who aren't good drivers. And so I think that's something that we have to think about. There are some really serious consequences of this big data that are fascinating, but they also can have some very unintended consequences that we need to be concerned about. Is that the thing that Flo gives out in the commercial? And she says, stick it in <laughs> she your car? She doesn't tell you about that. Is that, the one? Yeah, is that, that device? Right. Is that really the device she's giving out to place in your car and monitor how you there, drive? There are examples. I don't know if she's the one who's doing that, but uh, you know. I've I, seen her give out something in the commercial. But, but, but there, are, there are insurance companies out there that do offer discounts for those who are willing to do that. And you can imagine that across all different kinds of insurance, health insurance, for example. So we talk about you know, uh, the uh, diet and you know, losing weight and so on. Well, you can imagine a situation where uh, a health insurer will give you a discount if, they are willing, if you're willing to let them monitor your diet. And that can have tremendously important public health implications uh, if we get a sense of you know, what eating habits are, where the problems are lying, what's creating diabetes. But at the same time, it also creates some potential uh, you know, invasions to your privacy. If, for example, you had a little bit too much to, your dr to drink and you, know, you uh, are, are dealing with certain kinds of addiction, is that the kind of thing that you really want to be broadcasting on Facebook? I think we have to keep that in mind. Can, can you tell by observing big data and people's habits and things like that 
how the stock market's going to go. Well, it, it, in fact, there's a study that we've been working on that's looking at Twitter data, and we're not trying to forecast the stock market for uh, uh, profit uh, purposes, but of we're looking not. at, uh, we're, but we are, but we are looking at things like volatility, and it turns out that when you get a certain uh, increase in tweets about a particular stock, take a ticker symbol for example, uh, when you get a certain number of tweets uh, and it goes up over time, you can actually show that the stock market volatility increases for that particular stock. So imagine if you can monitor all of this traffic on a real-time basis, you can actually get a sense of how the market is moving, when we're about to uh, get into a, a potential crash, and uh, ultimately be able to do something about that. Well, let's say I, I, wanna, I start to create a conversation on Twitter about a certain stock because I know you're watching it. Right. Well, so how do you the, deal the, with that? Well, the stock market is one of these really interesting things where it matters not just what you think, but also what I think. But more importantly, what I think you think, and what you think I think you think, and it goes on and on. And this is where rumors. Is there any science actually, behind it? Well, actually, there's quite a lot of science behind it. You know, one good example. Oh, okay. uh, that well, answers that question. I would say it's called. It, I, I would call it finance. Uh, <laughs> but but actually, to, to make that distinction explicit, you know, one of the uh, one of the benefactors of this festival uh, is uh, the Simons Foundation. The Simons Foundation was started by a mathematician by the name of James, uh, James Simons, uh, a first-rate mathematician, author of Chern-Simons theory, which is at the heart of some uh, modern-day string theory uh, ideas. But uh, about 20 years ago, Simons decided to start a hedge fund. And this is probably the most successful hedge fund in the history of all investments. And what he does, nobody really knows what he does because it's a hedge fund, but what people think he does uh, is use big data, and he used big data before it was called big data, uh, and he constructs patterns uh, that are able to be uh, used as predictive measures for uh, trading. Do, do these patterns come from anything in nature that we would be looking at for another science reason? Take the math or the statistics of that and then apply it to the stock market or hedge funds? Oh, well, there's a lot of that. In fact, um, uh, there's a rumor that uh, part of what uh, uh, Renaissance uh, Technologies, that's the name of the company that uh, Simon started, uh, a rumor that uh, part of what they do is uh, speech recognition. And the rumor got started because at one point, Renaissance hired the entire IBM speech recognition team from the Thomas J. Watson Research Labs. So I think that there's just, a lot of science in hint. what they do. <laughs> yes, that's right. Go ahead, but, no, please. Jeff, so please. I, know, I know several of those speech recognition people. Um, one of them was George Swig, who thought of quarks, you know, around independently of Murray Gell-Mann. And um, so this is just a generally a genius person, aside from working on speech recognition. This is just a very high-powered mind. But some of the younger people that also were hired were people that I, um, you know, were my classmates in undergraduate math courses, also tremendous intellects. And just a couple of interesting little facts. First, they all want to still be professors. I ask them, you know, like, how much money do you make? They don't really want to talk about that. What do you invest in besides Renaissance? Just the same thing you would, the S&P 500. So, so there are certain surprising things, but, but to me the most surprising was that uh, what they're really looking for, they don't want people trained in finance or economics. They think that they are corrupted by lots of, you know, they're polluted by the wrong training. So what kind of scientist do they want to hire or mathematician? I thought this was amazing. There's a very specific niche that they like the best. You want to guess what it is? Physics. Close. Trickier. Who, who would deal with noisy data and be a physicist? Uh, JPL. JPL, very good. It's something like the jet propulsion. They like astrophysicists because the, the data that comes from stars, very noisy. you know, is going through the atmosphere. It's hitting turbulence. And, and so they're not the physicists that are studying super clean data in the lab. That's the wrong thing for someone doing finance. You want, a physis you want the brain of a physicist but the dirt of someone who deals with, with noisy data and can cope with it. And apparently astrophysicists are the sweet spot. What, do you, what does an astrophysicist get versus this guy who's going to work on Wall Street? <laughs> don't ask me. I mean, Andy knows the numbers. I don't know. <laughs> I want to put one or two extra zeros at the end of the Yeah. <laughs> a couple of orders of magnitude. Right, uh, sure. Yeah, an astrophysics professor makes about $100,000 to $200,000 a year. Mm -hmm. At a good, at an elite university, so yeah, I think that's twenty lunch million. Money for Wall Street. That's yeah, that's chump yeah. change. <laughs> chump change. Uh, 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 is there still a drain? Is still is there still a brain drain? And the physics, well, physicists, uh, and scientists going there? 
Oh, yeah, there's, a, I, think, I think there, I believe that for quite a long time there have been more people with PhDs in physics working on Wall Street than there have been on the faculties of the physics departments in the country. But I want to correct this misconception. Mm -hmm. It's not as if Wall Street is seducing all of these physicists from a higher calling. <laughs> it's the fact that we're producing so many physicists that don't have jobs because we actually, <laughs> and... That is true. Yeah. And, and that's what I, I made that comment earlier that I don't think you guys really got, that even though they're making many tens of millions of dollars a year, these guys still want to be professors. That is, there's some, I mean, we're at the World Science Festival. Science is extremely appealing. I've no disrespect to finance. But um, <laughs> in their heart, all these guys, the topologists and the physicists and astrophysicists, they're all asking me, what's it like to be a math professor? They still really, in their heart of hearts, want to do that. But it's hard for them to give up you, you know. should say, give me 500000 and yeah, I'll tell I you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I ought to trade with them for a year or two. Well, yeah, I think the real reason is, so you know, you, the, in finance, you, know, you have to have people who have their feet on the ground, but they're, as you're saying, their head in the stars. They really have to have very good mathematical skills, but they have to have very good empirical knowledge of what's going on and a way to put these models together. So the natural person you want is an unemployed string theorist for that, because these are people... <laughs> Can I say that, that um, social scientists also increasingly are being recruited as data scientists, uh -huh. because the data that we deal with is way messier than anything probably even an astrophysicist have, has dealt with. So we, we get lots of training in statistics, lots of training in econometrics, um, and lots of training in applied problems, which you don't see a lot of economists getting. A lot of economists, they're, they're pure theorists. Um, and so it's been interesting to me that it's, a lot of the non-economists have been pulled into Silicon Valley to work for a lot of these organizations. Mm -hmm. And probably you should go without saying, but just to underscore the obvious, they, um, you have to be able to compute. You have to be able to code, as we say right. nowadays. Right. If you can't program computers comfortably, you're not in the game. Right. You wrote something interesting about well, all this data and all this uh, collection of data. Um, even though we're all connected together and we have all these friends and Facebook friends, people are st still lonely. Very, very lonely. Talk about the studies that are involved in yeah, this. So we actually studied the spread of loneliness, um, which is sort of interesting because loneliness is how we feel about connection. Um, and there's actually only a, a, a slight correlation between feeling lonely and actually having few friends when we ask people to name their friends. Um, but one of the interesting things in that study is that that feeling can spread, that sense of being alone. Even if you have lots of friends, you might feel alone in a crowd. And, and not only what did we find in that study that when you feel more lonely that you're likely to have fewer friends in the future, but also when you have fewer friends, you're more likely to feel alone in the future. So there's this back and forth thing that happens where the edges of the network can actually um, sort of get frayed, like pulling a string on a sweater, um, which gives this idea of how important it is to reach out to people who are disconnected to try to keep this from infecting the whole network. So one person's loneliness can make other people feel lonely, and that can make... Right. I should emphasize, though, that one of these, and this, this relates to one of Steve's points, this is based on an observational study. Um, and so we use statistical models to try to figure out how much of this correlation is actually the result of a causal process. But we don't have the good mathematical models of that yet. There's a big debate now in statistics about how you tease these things apart. If you and I are the same, how much of this is the fact that I chose you as a friend, and how much of this is the fact that I influence you? If it's one thing versus the other, you have completely different policy prescriptions for what we should be doing. If it's not infectious, if you just choose only friends, then there's not going to be any spillover effect from, from treating one person. It's not going to spread to other people. Hmm. How do you study it then? I mean, if you don't have the... We cool. do the best we can, and there's, there's different ways that you can, can um, get more leverage. So one of the things that we use is asymmetry in friendships. So if I asked you to name your top 10 friends. Right. I've and run then, out of three, so let's see. Uh, so, okay, so there you go. So limited to three. I'll go ask them to name their friends. Right. Sometimes they won't name you back. <laughs> That's why I have only three, I think. <laughs> So we can use that asymmetry because when you name someone, you're thinking of them, they seem like a friend to you, you pay attention to them, but they aren't necessarily paying attention to you. And so we expect that a change in you predicts a change in, um, sorry, a change in them predicts a change in you, but not vice versa. And so that's one thing that we've done to try to make it more likely that what we're seeing in this non-experimental data is, is something that's a causal process. But the math of it is, is actually quite complicated sometimes. Is the, and there are enough, you said 60% of people are on Facebook, is that what I heard? It's more than 60% now. So yeah. That's enough people, even if we leave out the people who are not, who are not tabulated because they're not on Facebook, that's enough to make a, a good 
95% prediction of how people are doing or what these, these data show? Well, um, so we are always obsessed in the social sciences with representativeness, right? So um, if I were to do a study on the members of this audience right now, there are probably key ways in which they are different from the general population. You guys are way more interested in science probably than the, the average um, uh, person in America. But on Facebook, when you compare lots of these different things, they look very much the same. Um, there's a little bit fewer more women, um, there may be a fewer more liberals, but these are tiny, tiny effects. It's like a 1% difference or something like that. Well, getting back to this question of loneliness, if everybody's passing loneliness around, and loneliness is this communal thing, <laughs> then for me, to, or for you, or psychologist, to somebody to treat loneliness in some individual, you have to treat the whole crowd. Yeah, that's one of the implications. If this is a causal effect, not just for loneliness, but for obesity, smoking, drinking, happiness, depression, all the things that we've looked at, the implication is that, that these are social phenomena. It's not one patient and one uh, disease. It's, you know, it's a group that you should be reaching. And one of the things that we found in our drinking study was that although men were more likely to drink heavily, women were more influential on other people when they stopped drinking. And so if you want men to quit drinking, what our study suggested is that you ought to actually treat the women because you'd reach more men getting the women to change. Um, and so it's the friends who might actually want, you want to be the target of, you want, you want to target the friends in order to reach more people in the network. And this is this idea of friends as multipliers. The fact that the women reach more people, you might get more bang for your okay, buck by doing Okay, it gets back that. to your ethics question that you didn't want to touch before. <laughs> if I know from my study that this person is a drinker and I want to help that person to treat that drinker, don't I have to go to their friends and tell them that that person is drinking? Not and therefore, you're shaking your head, yes, yes, and a no. I mean, don't, don't I have to reveal some sort of confidence about that? It depends on the intervention. Maybe instead of like, raising the drinking behavior or trying to dampen the drinking behavior, you raise some other behavior that's positive that's a substitute for that behavior, and you never have to mention it at all. But this is, that is an ethical question you'd want to ask, is do you reveal this? Or there was a, an incident with Target using big data um, to try to predict um, uh, who was likely to be pregnant because they wanted to send out flyers to them, oh, we're good for baby clothes. Um, and there was a dad who didn't know that his daughter was pregnant, um, and it, it yielded a very difficult situation because they inferred that Target knew this, and then they found out. And so you can imagine that even though you have these mechanisms in place that mm -hmm. don't ever say drinking, people can kind of figure it out. Um, so, so the ethical questions definitely are there. Seth, you're just shaking your head like... Well, I thought that Target's main big data experiment was to give away millions of credit card numbers <laughs> to the Romanian mafia. <laughs> it's all about the money in the end. I hope is they're not the sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew, is there anything else about the stock market? I mean, uh, can, can we predict or can we create? I know we've seen these flash trades and things like that. Can you create something erroneous by not having good data if the, if the data you feed it is the old garbage in, garbage out from the old computer day? Well, definitely. I think the stock market is uh, you know, a very complicated beast, uh, much more so than any kind of physical system because you're dealing with uh, human behavior. Uh, and so I think that by using data in the right way, we can say a lot of interesting and useful things about the stock market, but using data in the wrong way, we can actually create panics, crashes, uh, and other kinds of instability. And uh, there's a lot of people whose savings are at stake, so I think that we have to be very careful about this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, well, there's something I, I've been sort of itching to say. I don't know if it's going to get us anywhere, but I'll just let it out there, which is that um, I feel like the word prediction is being used in a couple different ways, and it might be helpful to distinguish. One being, uh, you know, like if your friend is chubby, I can predict you're chubby. That's a correlation. There's also the prediction in the old school sense of there's going to be a solar eclipse tomorrow, right? That is to tell something ahead of time that's not just a correlation, but you see what I mean? It's a difference. It's a, thinking about a time series, some events unfolding over time. In physics and in traditional, say, physical sciences, astronomy, chemistry, you know, if I say I, I can predict the product of this reaction, that's, I, I think of prediction as having to do with unfolding in time, and that's an intrinsically very, very difficult problem um, that, like, when I see the title of this session, Go Figure Predicting the World with Math, I think, good luck. You know, it's very hard to do. We, we can only do that in a few subjects. Um, we can do it very well in astronomy if we only study two objects. 
That is, right. if it's the, the Earth going around the sun, yes, we, Newton solved the two-body problem in the 1600s. It predicts that planets move in ellipses. They more or less do. But, you know, even Newton said that when he tried to include the moon, they referred to, he called it the problem of the moon. Nowadays, we call it the three-body problem, the sun, the Earth, and the moon. He said his problem never ached as when he tried to solve the problem of the moon, and he couldn't solve it, and no one could solve the three-body problem. Um, and in the late 1800s, Poincaré explained why, that the, the three-body problem has chaos in it. That is, slight uncertainties in the states of the planets, that is, where they are or how fast they're moving, quickly get amplified to a point where we, we can't make meaningful predictions over the long term. I mean, we can in the short term. We know where the moon will be, you know, tomorrow or whatever. And, and so, of course, you can do <laughs> rocket science. The moon will be there when you get there. But, um, <laughs> but, but, five, but five, five million years from now, we won't know where right. the moon is. Right. That is, it's been shown that the whole solar system is chaotic. You might not think so. You think the clockwork universe, what's more orderly than the solar system? Well, the solar system is actually a chaotic system, but with a time scale of five million years, meaning if we want to predict out a few million years, we're okay, but way past that, we really don't know where, where the individual planets are going to be with any precision. So I guess I sort of feel like when we talk about these prediction problems, we're pretty good at the correlation problems, but they to me feel, I mean, maybe they're the more important well, ones. So Steve, let me uh, stop you because I think yeah. I, I, you're getting at a very important point. Um, I mean, you care about is, the prediction of time. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that the distinction that you're talking about has really to do with the degree of uh, understanding of the phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to, to take your point about predicting a solar eclipse, right now we can predict a solar eclipse to the millisecond of when it's going to occur, where it's going to occur, how it's going to occur. But let's go back a thousand years. Right. We went back a thousand years. A solar eclipse was a religious event that yes. you know held tremendous, you know, political importance, and you know there was very, very great efforts, uh, you know, uh, expended at trying to predict them at, with very little success. Mm -hmm. They had correlations, but not predictions. Right. And so I look at the world as uh, uh, different levels of complexity allow for different degrees of prediction. Mm -hmm. So uh, mathematics, physics, they enjoy precision that most other fields don't. Uh, and in fact, I think there's a hierarchy of certainty that starts with mathematics and then physics and then chemistry, biology. And when you get all the way down to economics, you're dealing with situations where we can't say anything about the future because we, yeah, it's so much more complicated. In, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, we have, we have problems predicting the past, never mind predicting the future. That's good. Yeah, you got that down. <laughs> so, but I think it's the nature of the beast. And what it means yeah, yeah. is that we need to have better tools, uh, and we need to work harder at this, these problems. We need smarter people involved in helping us Well, we should also not exaggerate what we can do in physics. I mean, maybe Seth should weigh in about, you know, there's fundamental limitations through quantum physics about even predicting physical systems. Yeah, I mean, so, so in, in quantum mechanics, the world is intrinsically probabilistic. I mean, Einstein hated this. He famously said, God doesn't play dice, but, you know, he was wrong. You should, we, we just happen to kind of suck it up. The world is intrinsically probabilistic. There's and some dice up there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, um, and in fact, this gets uh, these little quantum, if we actually look at all these chancy events that you were talking about from chaos, what does chaos do? Why is it, it are things unpredictable? It's because the things that are like the, the motion of the planets amplifies tiny, tiny little fluctuations in, in this motion until they become unpredictable. So actually what's, what the motion of the planets is doing, even though planets are gigantic, huge things, they're amplifying what are the end, little tiny quantum mechanical fluctuations, mm -hmm. and so bringing them up into the macroscopic world so that after five million years, the fact that you can't p predict where Uranus is going to be, oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter. Sorry, <laughs> Old, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Hang out with nerdy guys. <laughs> yeah, so that, that actually in, in, is in, at bottom a quantum mechanical okay, uncertainty. <laughs> oh. <laughs> in Uranus, buddy. <laughs> so, though that's interesting, there's actually, um, I, I just to, I'm not going to disagree with you, Andrew, about, about well, I guess I'm going to disagree with your hierarchy that puts economics at the bottom. So, um, there I go again. Right, maybe, <laughs> maybe history is below that. I don't yeah. know. So um, there's a, a, in addition to this kind of unpredictability that comes from intrinsic chanciness, there's a kind of unpredictability that comes from the fact that even if everything is deterministic, there's certain things we know we can't predict. 
Um, there's, a, the, the, there's a famous example of this from Alan Turing's halting problem, which says, if you set a computer going on and program in a particular way, there's no way to tell what it's going to do. You know, it, you, you can't tell if it's going to give you an answer or when it's going to give you an answer. And this comes not because it's indeterministic or probabilistic, it comes because these computers have this kind of self-reference capacity. Um, and in, in the case of human beings, we have this, what you were, were saying, you know, it's not just, you know, you thinking about what I, I'm going to do, and uh, I'm thinking about what you're going to do, but it's you thinking about what I'm thinking about you're going to do. This kind of, whenever you have this kind of self-referential self loops, you end up with a kind of paradoxical situation that you can prove that you can't know what's going to happen. But, but again, there's a huge gap between where physics is and where the social sciences are. For example, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us that there are certain things that we simply can't know and predict, but that doesn't stop you from building a bridge that doesn't collapse, and it doesn't stop you from getting to the moon. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, where, where were those theories in economics that could have prevented us from having 11% unemployment? Couldn't do that. Well, but we, but we have ways that we have a whole advertising industry is based on predicting what you're going to buy, right? We know enough about you, we, we put commercials out, we know how you're going to behave. So that's prediction certainly in, in commercial field. So, so that's actually something that we started working on. Uh, we actually uh, uh, got a large uh, commercial bank to partner with us and give us their data for consumer credit card accounts. And by looking at a 1% sample of their consumer credit card uh, data, which is about a terabyte a month, uh, what we were able to show is that you could actually see the credit crisis coming about uh, 12 to 18 months before it actually hit. Now, that's only because that's you That's in retrospect, have... did you say? No, no, no. Actually, you out can, of sample, you, you, it, it, you, know, uh, uh, you could have seen it uh, uh, 16 to 18, 18 months ahead of time uh, using early data that was a holdout sample. Right. And so had we had these techniques back in 2006 and 2007, uh, we could have actually started doing something about it earlier on. But at that time, nobody was looking at all of the data in, in this way. Are they doing that now? They're starting to. So we're collaborating with the Office of the Controller of the Currency uh, at uh, the US Treasury that's responsible for uh, regulating banks. And we're using some of these machine learning tools on 19 of the largest banks' data to try to see whether or not we can identify these problems. Can we ask you about the, that credit crisis a little bit more? Because I thought I remember reading lots of articles in the paper by people saying that there were problems, but then the articles didn't get much traction. That is, I don't, I mean, wouldn't you agree? It wasn't that we didn't see it coming. It wasn't exactly, in fact, didn't we once go to a meeting together about risk management? Yep. <laughs> we, we did. I, we did. I, and actually, that I, was a, that was a meeting where... And you know, before it happened, yes. I sort of remember going and, to some meeting I, like some that. Some of the data that we had looked at was indirect data from hedge funds that, that indicated that the risk was building up. Yeah, I thought so. Absolutely. The problem is that unless you get incontrovertible feedback that a crisis is developing, and by incontrovertible, I mean from you know, a well-respected, uh, third-party, unbiased agency that displays this, it's very hard to get action. So, for example, you know, there are people that, uh, you know, when a big storm is coming, their joints start hurting, you know, they get a little bit cranky. Mm -hmm. And so if they started telling you, Steve, you know, you really ought to move out of that, uh, you know, sh you know uh, uh, waterfront apartment because uh, <laughs> a, a storm is coming, you might not take it as seriously as if you heard that from the National Weather Service. Mm -hmm. We don't have a national weather service for a financial crisis. And if we did, I think we'd be able to do a lot better at dealing with these kinds of things. You, you, but well, let me just put global warming into that pot because we have a lot of data about global warming and 97% of the global warming scientists believe it's happening and it's already going on. Yet there's a whole bunch of people who still don't believe in it. Well, so I think that, that climate change is complicated and it's complicated by a number of factors. One, of course, is the science, which is not transparent. And even though a number of the scientists agree, I think that there are some people, you're right, that are simply non-believers. They just, no matter what they say, uh, you, they will not believe, uh, no matter what you say to them, they won't believe it. But I think there's a much more uh, complicated question, which is, let's suppose it is true. Let's suppose that uh, the climate is changing. What do we do about it? You see, it turns out that it's very costly for us to engage in various different kinds of uh, actions to deal with climate change, and therefore it becomes an economic question, costs versus benefits. So here's the question. The question is, how do you discount the future costs and benefits? It turns out that if you discount it at a rate of 1.3%, then we gotta do something right now, it's really important. If you discount it at 1.1%, it turns out it doesn't matter, let the future take care of it. And so that trade-off between current prosperity and you know, future uh, generations 
It's a very complicated question to, uh, to deal with. So I think we actually need better analytics before we can actually make a statement about what we ought to do about it. You mean the fact that Florida is going to be underwater is not enough? <laughs> So well, that doesn't move the bar at all. The fact that we have to move all these people away from coastlines doesn't change so, that fact. So fact let me. So let me. I'm make not the, done yet. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all these people are going to be displaced. All these industries are going to be out of business. All these homes, all these flooding. That doesn't move the bar. Well, suppose that in order to move the bar, it turns out that we actually have to increase the poverty line by an extra 5% because we'll have less money to spend for social programs. So now you're trading off the people in Florida and California and Massachusetts with people in Montana and in Idaho and Wyoming. Well, if they don't have any rain or Texas doesn't get any water, that's going to be part of that. No one, it seems to me, no one is putting those numbers in about. Right not doing something, right. the so, truth about not doing something, not that, forget the carbon tax and all that stuff, the, tr the, the truth of how all of this is going to be So, So I costly. agree 100%. What we need to do is to ask better questions, collect better data to be able to ask the right questions. But frankly, when it comes right down to it, you're thinking about a carbon tax and other kinds of behavioral adjustments. I think that in the end, it's going to be very hard for us to deal with that. It's a bit like telling your teenagers you know, to uh, abstain from, uh, from sex. You know, abstention is a, a, a way to deal with the problem, but it's not very realistic. So what's the point of making all these predictions? Well, I think that... Well, we've predicted this is going to happen if no one is going to do anything about it. So let Good me night, everybody. Drive home safely, you know? <laughs> let, me, let me give you an example of what I think, what, why, we, why we do this. I think that if we don't do anything, I predict there'll be a number of problems. A number of scientists will predict there are a number of problems. Therefore, the purpose of prediction is to get all of you to start thinking about this. For example, instead of worrying about climate change, carbon taxes, and discount rates, why not start thinking about geoengineering, coming up with the next generation technology? Two years ago, there was an announcement in Nature that they discovered a bacteria that can digest methane gas, which is worst of the greenhouse gases. What if we could re somehow genetically engineer bacteria to remove some of the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere? That's one of the reasons why I think we're here today. It's because having more scientists involved in asking the right questions, developing better technologies, is ultimately the, the reason that we do this and why prediction can actually be important. Do you think scientists... Do you, do you think scientists should step up and be more vocal about these things themselves? If they know this we're, stuff? we're on stage here, and none of us are naturally uh, photogenic, so. <laughs> I speak for myself. <laughs> so I must, I've got to say, the notion of having a whole bunch of 747s out there dumping millions of pounds of bacteria into the atmosphere, I find a little alarming. <laughs> Might take more than a few 747s. Um, let's, let's, um, oh, I had a question about, um, uh, so let's talk about freedom and free will. If you can predict all these things, are we beyond the capacity to change any of these predictions about how people behave? I mean, for example. I, I mean, want to make another distinction. Yeah. Um, the, I think the eclipse example was a really good example, not only um, the way Steve used it, but also in terms of the, the percentage of accuracy. Right, so, um, so we can get that down to a single point in time. When we talk about predictions in social science, we are usually conceptualizing things stochastically um, because we don't have enough information about all the different things that will affect a single human decision, let alone a whole set of people's human decisions, to say with deterministic accuracy what exactly is going to happen. We're, we're never going to be in a situation where we can say exactly that you're going to do X on Y day the same as we are with, with, a, with an eclipse. Um, and so the analogy here is to, to physical systems like the weather. Um, where, where we, we actually know a lot about what's going to happen over the next five days in terms of the weather, and that's incredibly useful for us as a society to learn that. I would like to be able to do that for political systems and for economic systems to get at least some short-term monitoring so that we can prepare for these storms that are coming towards us. Can, I'm sorry. I think there's a real challenge there, which is that you know, when you predict a tornado is about to hit, the fact that the tornado knows your prediction doesn't change its path. Whereas for economic systems, that's a real problem. Uh, the fact is that our predictions can actually affect the way people behave. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, this morning I mentioned at the session that you know, Richard Feynman, the great physicist, summed it up very nicely. He said, imagine how much harder physics would be if electrons had feelings. <laughs> and uh, in fact, you know, the, because we all have feelings, the, the marketing firms can predict our behavior. But as they engage in certain kinds of marketing campaigns, 
we actually change our behavior in response. This and that's is, the complexity. This is why the social sciences are the hard sciences. Yes. And why we start with physics, and then with chemistry, and then with social sciences. Right. You mean difficult sciences. Yes. <laughs> Not hard sciences. Um, that's right. So, so go ahead. I didn't really notice that. That is the distinction. It's hard versus soft, not hard versus easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, you didn't notice it because you're not a social scientist. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why I'm si that's why I'm sitting here. I like it. it. Can I just point, it, point out but, but that, that, um, that uh, if, if you have the word science in your discipline's names, it's not, it's not, like, it's not a suggestion that you are a scientist. It's a suggestion that you're worried you're not a scientist. Like, Library science. All right, okay, okay kids. So. <laughs> All right, kids, you got to behave. You got to behave while you're up here. You got to behave. My, my question, um, did you want to... Yeah, uh, so about, you were asking about, about free will. Yes. And, um, and indeed, this is, you know, we're in fact, when talking about global warming, we're talking about our collective free will as a society. Can we exert it to change things that we don't want to have happen? Um, and... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a little more concerned than, than Andrew is about, about Florida being underwater, I have to say. So, um, and can we, um, then can we predict what the results of our actions will be, both as individuals and as a society? So there's, um, uh, I, I would claim that the answer is in general, no, we can't predict that. Um, and this has to be go with to these, these questions about, um, that I was mentioning before about um, Turing's halting problem. You know, that, that says, and this is something everybody, it sounds like a, something that's very esoteric, but something everybody has experienced because it means, the halting problem basically means there's no way to debug a computer program in general. There can be no universal debugger because the very first thing you'd want this debugger to do is say, I type in something or I click on this, you know, will something happen at all? And you can't answer that question. There's no general way of answering that question. So when your computer crashes or when things go wrong, this is intrinsically built into the way that computers work. It's also intrinsically built into the way that societies and human beings work. So you know, the central experience of free will is that you know, I can't predict what I'm going to do. Even on you know, very simple things, like you know, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, should I have caffeinated coffee or decaffeinated coffee? Well, you know, caffeine would be more exciting, but you know, decaf is safer. I'm not gonna know what I'm gonna decide until I actually make but the decision. But that's not true if he's right about what his friends on Facebook are doing. I didn't say, I didn't right? say that his wife might not be able to predict no, what no, he can his, do or his if, friends. <laughs> if his friends, if your friends are all having decaf at four, he's gonna have decaf at four, right? Probably. I mean, but that's, that's the point. Well, and even more to the point, if we were to stick you into a brain scanner, the, the, the neuroscientists would know before you do what you're going to choose. That's right, but I would claim that that's actually, that's irrelevant to my sense of having free will. So, so yeah, some neuroscientists could stick some electrodes into my brain, or you could look at my Facebook page, or my wife could actually, because she knows me, would be able to know what I'm going to do. But that's different from me knowing what I'm going to do. Right. And I can't know what I'm going to do. You can take the same math that Turing used to prove the halting problem, apply it to you, you yourself and say, can, or to me, and say, can I know what I'm going to do? when I'm making a decision? And the answer is no. I can't know what, I'm gonna, what decision I'm gonna make some very substantial fraction of the time. And you can take that, exactly that same mathematics and apply it to human societies or to economic systems and ask, is society capable of predicting what it's going to do? And the answer is no, it can't, not all the time, because of this endless kind of second guessing, essentially, that we, we all do with each other. But I hear, I hear him saying that we're close to the minority report here. <laughs> but instead of having those women in the bathtub, uh, whatever that was down there, you have Facebook and the, other, you, and the other kinds of predictive values of Twitter and the other social networks. And they can predict when he's going to murder someone. I mean, not literally. Well, when he's going to have his... I don't have a Facebook page or a Twitter account. So <laughs> <laughs> he's off you're the out of luck, buddy. But it is kind of <laughs> this is predict in the Las Vegas sense. Las Vegas can make a lot of money because they know that you're going to do something 51% of the time. Um, and I, this is the way, con, you know, these companies are going to use this consumer information. It's a double zero on the roulette wheel. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? So you don't want to play roulette. It's the worst game in Las Vegas, and they know that, right? So, um, so, so it's not like we know exactly what you're going to do tomorrow, but we, we know uh, we can narrow the space enough that is very useful if we're trying to change your behavior, if we're trying to get you to buy something, if we're trying to change society's behavior, say, in a good way or in a way to make profits. Hmm. Do, we, do we know, can you predict, how good would you be at predicting when society is going to change its mind about something? 
When is it going to, you know, we, we, we saw up there about the slides of uh, predicting who's going to be nominated or elected president. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a changing mind or something. But what about its attitude about global warming or evolution or something? There, there when it's going to make a paradigm shift? Yeah, there's some good research on, uh, on uh, attitudes towards gay marriage um, and how we've seen a real phase transition in, in those attitudes changing. Um, and you um, have people like Robert Cialdini who have studied uh, social norms, which get, really gets into this, um, I'm going to do what everyone else does because I expect them to do it, and I expect that they expect I'll do it. And when you try to change people's behavior one at a time, it doesn't work because you have to change these mutual expectations. Um, people like Jerry Mackey, who has um, really helped with ending uh, female genital cutting in Africa, the way they do is they bring everybody out into the village square, and they all announce simultaneously, we're not going to do this. Because if you just do it one household at a time, people don't see the other people doing the announcement. And it's that mutual sort of declaration that has to happen. So when you see a change in something like our attitudes towards gay marriage, one of the reasons why it takes so long to do the change, even though people, uh, and there's some evidence that many people were ready to change their mind for a long time before we all actually change, was that they didn't think other people had changed yet. And so as a result, it, you, this, you, this phase transition is delayed. So there's a good example of that in, uh, in finance that was actually part of the financial crisis. You know, it used to be that 10 or 20 years ago, if you were to default on your home mortgage, that would be considered you know, an absolute disaster, it'd be shameful. You know, you'd have to look at your banker in the eye and explain why you couldn't pay. Uh, but something happened uh, over the last uh, 20 years where um, after a while, people began to realize that paying a mortgage on a house that's worth half of what it used to be doesn't make any more sense. And so a couple of economists, uh, Paolo Sapienza and Luigi Zingales, did a survey of individuals over a period of time to see what their attitudes were towards defaulting on your home mortgage. And they found out something really shocking, which is that over time, over the recent past, uh, it became clear that at some point, the attitude towards defaulting on a mortgage changed so that it's not so much a shameful thing, but rather a smart economic decision. These so-called strategic defaults began to become more common. And you can actually show that in neighborhoods where somebody defaulted, it's a lot more likely that you're going to default because you've heard about it. Uh, it's not nearly as big a deal. Uh, the people that you know are good people, and they defaulted, so therefore it's OK for you to default. So that's an example where if you could actually get that kind of data, and you can see that type of social norm changing over time, you could actually predict when society was going to change in some pretty important ways. But that must have really thrown all the models off. That all of a sudden, people were doing this strategically. It did. Um, um, and there's another nice recent story about the failure of big data because you didn't take into account that the ecology would change. So um, you can use searches on Google for things like cough, flu, um, uh, medicine, to predict actually how many people have the flu at any one time. And so Google created this thing called Google Flu Trends that was very, very good at tracking the CDC reports for how many people in the United States had the flu. It worked really great for the first couple of years, and then it started working less and less well. Um, and one of the reasons why, as it was reported in a paper by David Lazar and, and Gary King recently, was because they didn't update the, mo the model. They didn't go back to the CDC data to see whether or not there were different words that were predicting this. And these online eco ecologies are changing so fast. The way we use the internet is changing so fast. What, what social network you're on is probably different now than it was six months ago for some people. Uh, all those things are changing so rapidly that we're going to have to constantly reconnect to real world ground truth data in order to be able to make the right predictions. Is there a possibility, and uh, I'll say danger, that, that people know that they're being probed for all this data and all this information and they don't like it and they start saying, you know, I'm going to start lying about all my stuff and see what that gets you, uh, with, to predicting what I'm going to do. Is there a danger that can happen? We'll just learn how to predict when you're lying. So in, in our voting study, for example, we, we matched 61 million people to voter registration records. We know whether or not you got off the couch and you went to the polls. And we found that our message not only made people more likely to vote, it made people more likely to lie about voting. So now I have a model of, of not just the behavior, but of misrepresenting the behavior, which you might be able to apply. Now, Full disclosure, we're talking about a 1% change in behavior, 1% 1 probability change in, in behavior overall. I mean, it's a very large experiment, so there are a lot of people who are changed. But, but this is not like predicting the, an eclipse. This is like being Las Vegas and being able to do a little bit better. There's also an interesting example of, with big data and lying of, um, on the dating site OkCupid, okay, uh, how tall do people say they are? <laughs> and if you look at the, the distribution of how tall the men are, compared to how tall men are in the population at large, 
either people are two inches taller that belong to OkCupid, okay or everyone is just adding two inches to their height. How accurate are these? Same dating? thing with the women, actually. Yeah. They're all, they're taller how, how in terms of reporting. How successful are these dating sites? I, I'm not the right one to ask about that. I don't know. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been out, I've been out of the game for a while. But, but, you, but you are, because didn't you have an early experience with this? Yes, but it wasn't online. I, my wife and I did meet through something, but it wasn't an online site. But it was very helpful, and I'm gr eternally grateful. <laughs> two, two inches taller ever since. Yes, we've both gotten taller. <laughs> uh, well, today, about 20% of people um, who end up getting married say they met online for the first time. And um, that number has been pretty stable for the last five years or so, so I don't know if it's going to go any higher than that. But this is something where we are meeting is, has, has changed. And the interesting thing is that what that's really substituted is we used to meet people through family members more, mm -hmm. um, but our, our friends are still instrumental. In, in fact, meeting people through friends has actually increased at the same time as, as meeting uh, strangers online has increased. Hmm. What about, uh, let's talk about tools for the future. We hear a lot about quantum computing, Seth. How, how is this going to change the game of what we know and analyze the data? Well, so Making predictions. Yeah, so so um, quantum computers are these devices that my friends and I build that, are, that store bits of information on individual atoms and then use quantum weirdness to, uh, to try to calculate things that classical computers can't. How much, how much more powerful could they be? Quantum? They could be, so uh, in fact, for exactly these kinds of big data analysis kinds of um, methods, they could be very, very powerful. Um, Give me a number. Yeah, so, so actually, so, so my friends and I have also made some algorithms to do common um, uh, big data analysis things like support vector machines and actually these great topological methods for looking how we can morph different data sets into each other. And because these methods are just based on ordinary kind of linear algebra kinds of things, and quantum computers are exponentially faster than that. Than, than classical computers for this. So for instance, this, um, let's take this, uh, this hypothetical data set of all the genomes of all the human beings on, on Earth. So 20 billion bits, larger than any data set that we actually possess on computers right now. So to do a kind of clustering analysis from this, okay, well, you're gonna have to like, you know, take around 10 to the 20, maybe 10 to the 40 operations on, on a classical machine to do very common analyses. But on a quantum computer, you could analyze that data in, you know, on the order of a few hundred thousand time steps. And of course, the, the bad news is we don't have quantum computers yet that could do that. But the quantum computers that might be able to do that, these kinds of simple operations are around the corner. And, and uh, basically, for people who don't know the difference between a quantum computer and a regular computer, how does that what, what is a qubit versus a regular bit? Yeah, so the, the, quant the cent, well, okay. So um, uh, as I, I used to say that, that, that my co colleagues and I, we take you know, the intrinsic ability of quantum mechanics to process information, we exploit atoms and molecules to make them compute. But then I realized that was terribly politically incorrect. So I stopped doing that. In fact, I was stopped doing that when some uh, social anthropologist said to me, Seth, you know, rather than saying you exploit atoms to make them compute, <laughs> Why don't you just say you empower atoms to make them? <laughs> <laughs> it was a great moment in my life. I went from being an exploiter of atoms to an empower of atoms just in, 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 in a nanosecond. <laughs> so, so the kind of central weirdness of quantum mechanics is that something like an electron, which can store a bit, like an electron over here could be a zero, or an electron over here is one, and the distinction between zero and one is a bit of information. So in, in a quantum mechanics, an electron can be here and there at the same time. And uh, that means that this quantum bit, or qubit, as they call it. Actually, when I was a kid, a qubit was this distance from there to there, right? But, but uh, <laughs> that qubit can, can, in some funky quantum mechanical sense that nobody really understands, can be 0 and 1 simultaneously. Um, and I don't, you know. It, does who, who here understands that? I don't understand it. So, <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't but make any sense. But you can still make use of that. You can still make use of it, and the, the main use you can make is if you feed that bit to a quantum computer. Then, so say zero says do this, like add two plus two. One says do that, add three plus one. Then the quantum computer is now doing this and that simultaneously adding 2 plus 2 and 3 plus 1 at the same time. And it doesn't have to be just doing two things at once. It can be 4, 8, 16, a gajillion things at once. A gajillion is a large number. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so a billion, billion times faster, is that fair to say? 
Yeah, so take, take the, yes, it, for this kind of analysis, so the things that involve things like, you know, finding periodicities in, in functions or, or um, uh, 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 identifying clusters in, in, in data. So in principle, and as I say, we don't have the devices that can do this right now. In principle, you could, you could do this you know, billions of billions of times faster, or much more than a billion billion times faster. And how much more accurate would that make the five-day forecast? If we could apply it. <laughs> I, I don't think much more accurate, yeah. honestly, because I, I'm not sure that the limitation with the five-day forecast is the computing power. I mean, that's part of it. But there's the issue of measuring the state of the atmosphere and the oceans. That is, you need to know what the, what the conditions are right now to be able to predict what they're going to be like tomorrow or a few days from now. And so we would need to have sensors all over the place you know, and resolve to a much higher precision than we have. So I think even if we had much better computers, even exponentially better, as yeah. may happen when quantum computers come to exist, that doesn't mean we can predict the weather much longer. Um, you know, even, it's really quite nasty, this, this issue of chaos. That is, when we talk about the weather being predictable out to, you know, on the order of, of, of several days, um, there's a sort of fundamental limitation that has to do with the dynamics of the atmosphere and the ocean, not with computing or observation ability. That is to say there's a, again, actually the word exponential will come in. There's something about the nature of chaotic systems, which in this case is the exponential divergence between what really happens and what we predict will happen. That, that means that if you try to predict, say, I mean, roughly speaking, if I want to predict one unit of time longer, say one day longer, I might have to work 10 times as hard in terms of you know, 10 times the resolution in my measurements or 10 times better computer. And then if I want to go two days longer, I don't have to go 20 times better. I have to now go 100 times better. That is, it will grow by a factor. In this case, I'm saying 10. It's not really 10. But, I mean, it grows by a constant factor with each day that you want to improve. So I sort of think there's going to be a really fundamental barrier to predicting the weather more than, you know, a few weeks. I, I don't even think we'll ever be able to predict a month. Um, I doubt we could get to two weeks. And it's because of the weather. It's not because of computing or observation difficulties. You can't beat a chaotic system. You can't predict it much longer than this time called its predictability horizon, or its, um, I mean, we have jargon for what it's called, but call it that, the predictability horizon. And it's just kind of built in. You can't do much about it. So I, I have to say I'm a little bit skeptical about a lot of the things we're talking about here with regard to prediction of things that unfold in time. I think that's this distinction I was trying to make earlier. We can predict, as James um, and to some extent Andy have emphasized, in a probabilistic way if we're interested in correlations. What's the likelihood that you're going to behave this way or buy that thing? But it's still probabilistic. And if you want old time prediction, like we used to have in, you know, predicting solar eclipses or the planets, um, that is a rare jewel in, in science. It's, we basically still can't even do it today. Give me that old-time prediction? Yeah, give me that old-time prediction. <laughs> it, we're, we're really weak at it. I don't think we should underestimate how tough prediction is. What, um, what, besides, besides an eclipse, what's another old-time prediction? Well, tides? There, are, there are not, yeah, tides we're good at. Now, the tides have the advantage. I mean, that's an interesting example because the tides are geophysical, just like the weather. And yet, we're really good at predicting the tides. And the advantage is that the tides are basically periodic. They repeat. The weather doesn't <laughs> famously repeat. And um, that's fundamental, too. Things that are repetitious are, go hand in hand with being predictable, well, like we, eclipses, like Halley's about, Comet. What, well, you say time, <clears throat> excuse me, time elements are difficult. Yeah. What about the spread of diseases you were talking about, predicting that that's, the time? I think that's, that's time, but also there the issue is that we have a network problem, that, that we don't really know the actual social network of, of who spreads diseases to who. Nevertheless, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I'm not talking about the online social network. I mean, the real one where you're coughing on someone. And, <laughs> and it's, it's hard because sometimes it's a person on the bus who is not part of your, your life. They just happen to be on the bus. So there's a lot of randomness there. Um, and yet, it's amazing that like what James was saying, that, that by looking at the friends, you know, that is not just making measurements of me, but of my friends, because these tend to be friendly people, they are more likely to get coughed on. And so, I mean, maybe you should emphasize a little what, what an interesting study you did with the, the Harvard undergraduates. Well, I was going to say that um, um, although we don't have the full network, um, yeah. the, the part that we sample 
is on average going to be correlated with the part that we don't sample yeah, under yeah. certain circumstances. And so if you, if you go out and you, and you measure the fact that this person has five friends, you might have missed the fact that they actually have 10. But if you ask the questions the same with that person as everyone else, then on average, he's still going to be at the top of the list um, compared to someone who has four or three or two. In reality, they have eight or six or four, for example, but they're still going to have less. So you still want to focus your attention on these, these people who have more connectivity um, in the network. And the interesting thing about the social media data is that we are getting better and better at predicting who the real world friends are. Mm -hmm. So um, we uh, published a paper a couple of years ago, and other people have done this as well, where with 84% accuracy, we can predict who amongst your friends on Facebook is your best friend in real life, if we were to ask those two things separately. Um, and so, so we have some idea from this online social network who you're actually potentially coughing on. Um, and that may be even more important than the guy on the bus. Because there was a study um, conducted by some other researchers that looked at elementary school children um, and got their social networks, asked them who their best friends were. And they also had the maps of the assigned seats in classes. Mm -hmm. And people were more likely to get the flu from their best friend than from the person who was sitting next to them. Uh -huh. um, and so, so these real friend networks, although I agree that we're missing a lot of information that would be relevant for predicting the spread of, of the disease, sure. there may be enough information there in, in those as a proxy for the whole network that it could be really useful yeah. for giving yeah, no, some advance warning. That. Sure. You say real friends versus Facebook friends. Right, so face-to-face kind of -face friends. Face-to-face. Face -face. Right, you and I are friends now. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Off in that direction. <clears throat> You're up to three. No, four. Four, four. four. that's right. <laughs> feel like the Big Bang Theory show. The show the shell says, I'm back to seven. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, so, but the financial market, uh, go, getting back to this last question about quantum computing. And I want to say, we have time now for questions. If you have questions from the audience, uh, if you want to come up and, and find the microphones, we'll be able to ask a couple. Does, does, does quantum computing have a difference to predicting financial markets? It's, is well, that a time variant thing? or is I'm Predicting financial markets is just hard, right? And if I knew how to do it, I'd be rich, right? So, <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't. I don't know if it does for that. I mean, quantum computers are good for for specific kinds of of, of problems. That, um, for instance, the, these kinds of things that involve periodicities. Um, there, I mean, there's now a quantum computing company called D-Wave that claims to be able to solve quite hard problems. And actually, their, their devices do seem to solve hard problems. Whether they're doing it better than like, classical computers or not, I'm not sure. Mm. So, but I don't think that, I don't see any time soon that, the, um, that uh, quantum computers are going to be doing that much better in predicting well, financial markets. Well, especially since we don't have one. Since we don't have one, right. But of no. course, in predicting financial markets, not having a computer, flipping a coin is often, you know, a, a pretty good idea. As the, there, was, there, there was a famous dartboard um, dart portfolio constructed at random by throwing darts at the Is at that, the, is that the an urban method groups. did that really have? Yeah. That, that actually happened, it happened, and it is true that uh, <laughs> throwing darts, as long as you have a large number of darts, uh, actually works pretty well. If you throw one or two darts, not so much. Um, but let's keep in mind that uh, there are people out there who have predicted markets and have gotten rich, including James Simons. Right. So I think that prediction is possible, and we don't need the kind of prediction of the solar eclipse type. We can actually do very well with short-term correlations if your objective is just to try to identify patterns that you right. can trade on. Oh, oh, we got two or three people in the audience. I'll start here and then go back there. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Glenn Whitney from the National Museum of Mathematics. Um, and I was curious about the uh, fact that there was no worldwide SARS epidemic. Is that actually an instance where our ability to predict the future, predict how diseases are transmitted, really changed that future because we were then able to do the right things to, to head off uh, that from happening? Well, we don't know what would have happened if we hadn't done what we did. Um, but it looks like one of the things that was really effective there was getting enough early warning that they could shut down the airports um, to try to, to, to keep it localized in, in China at the time. I don't know if you guys know any more about this than, than that. Um, so, so some of that is, is you, know, you start to realize how important these, these long ties are in the network. I mean, those are the things that always um, are, 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 are capable of making diseases more infectious. Um, Steve has a great paper published. It was actually the paper that inspired me in graduate school um, with um, one of his collaborators, Duncan Watts, where he shows that if you take a regular ring, like say we're all holding hands, it's going to take a while for something to go all around the ring. But if you just put a few of these long distance ties, these long distance edges in the network, all of a sudden now, it's really easy to reach everyone all of a sudden. Um, and so if you can really take out those ties, then, then that's one way of reducing the likelihood that the epidemic is going to spread. 
Yes, sir. I'm Tom Keenan, I'm a science writer, and I wrote a book called uh, Techno Creep, What Makes Technology Creepy? Two of the things you mentioned are in that book. One of them <laughs> is the progressive insurance uh, monitor. And in fact, they don't use GPS. They eschew that because they say they don't want to be too creepy. It's actually really usage-based insurance. And with Target on that example, they actually brought it back, but they brought it back in a randomized way. So the pregnant girl still gets the ad with the pregnancy stuff in it, but she also gets barbecues and power tools. My question is, <laughs> where do you think the line is where we're going to say it's too creepy? I, so my, in my experience with doing research where I'm asking people for their data, I say, give me your data, and they say no. I say, here's a little picture of a bouncing monkey, and then everyone's saying yes, 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 yes. So with just a little bit of value, just a little bit of value, through revealed preference, people are showing that they're willing to share their data at a very large scale. It's not going to be everyone, but it's certainly the vast majority of people. When, when you ask people about these questions on surveys, you tell them, give me your data, most people say no. Um, you say, I'm going to give you a service in exchange for your data. You get 70, 80, 90 percent, depending on what the service is. That's why they're always saying you, you can be entered in a prize. Right. Yeah, like that's that. right. Maybe, perhaps, <laughs> you'll win. Yes. Yes, this is uh, about weather and technological change. Uh, what is today the probability or confidence level of predicting weather two weeks forward? And given the vast exponential progress in technology, what was it 40 years ago? Hmm. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know enough about weather. Does someone know? Well, I think so. Well, first of all, I predict it's going to be hot in two weeks from from, from today. <laughs> two weeks from now. Summer's coming on, and you know, but but in terms of these, uh, I've i noticed that um, that well, first of all, the United States is doing less well than Europe because we actually have fewer sensors in, uh -huh. in locally. Um, so, but I more than five days doesn't really seem to be I, I don't uh, really possible. Know the answer yeah. to your question, but I think um, in Nate Silver's book, in the Signal and the Noise, he has a chapter about weather prediction and its improvement. And I don't know, did you have a chance to look at that yet, or I, that might be a place to look. I don't. Maybe some people in the audience know if he directly answers that question. I, I don't happen They're to remember. They're googling it as we speak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, sir. I would just uh, like to get a picture of how you approach a single problem from your different disciplines. So could you just go down the panel and everybody pick one thing you would begin to ask or think about if you were trying to figure out if um, there was going to be a fundamental change toward democracy in China? <laughs> yeah, I, you want to stay? Well, I, I would like to try on that. Not, not to. I, it's going to be an evasive answer, but I feel like you're touching on a point that w we should have brought up earlier. Since I'm plugging other people's books, um, the black swan seems it should enter any discussion of, of predictability and the limits of predictability, because what you're talking about, you know, such a seismic shift in that country going to democracy, um, would be a black swan event. I mean, it's a really far out thing that's hard to predict, um, it seems to me. I mean, maybe my co-panelists will disagree that, about would, that. Would the, uh, would the Egyptian revolution be the same sort of thing that would have been hard to predict? I think so, in the yeah. timing of it. I mean, once it, so, so the characteristics of black swans that, that um, Nassim Taleb mentions in his book are that after the fact, they look very predictable and people make stories about how, we, yeah, of course, we saw this coming. But meanwhile, they didn't really see it coming. And um, there's no real theory that will let them see it coming. And that, some, like, it's a lesson we keep not learning, that we have this hubris that afterward we make stories about how it's rational, yet ahead of time, we, we can't do it. Well, there's a real difference between the underlying conditions and the timing. So I'm willing to say now, and you guys can check me, that within the next 20 years, China will democratize. And the reason why is because of the growth of the middle class there. And any time that you've seen growth of the middle class to, to the levels they're getting at now, you have seen demographic trans transitions within the next 20 years at, in, a, in a number of East Asian countries. Now, maybe we shouldn't be lumping all together. Anthropologists would probably be all crazy now saying, oh, you can't compare Korea to China for this reason and that reason. But if you're trying to generalize about those things, the conditions are right. And this is not just true because of the economics of it, because of the social networks of it. The people in the middle class, they tend to have more friends. They tend to be more connected. They're the people that you would want to be watching to try to figure out when one of these phase transitions is going to occur. Andy, this would seem perfect for financial markets yeah. to want to know, right? It, it, absolutely. And um, I think that maybe the, the point that we should keep our eyes on is the fact that prediction uh, is different at different horizons. 
And so uh, this idea of predicting when uh, a particular social uh, revolution will occur may be very difficult, but the idea of predicting over a period of 10 or 20 years that it will occur may be a very different matter. For example, I, I don't know what the weather's gonna be like three days from now or eight days from now, but I'm pretty sure that six months from now, it's gonna be colder outside. So I'm pretty you good You may be right, but not very useful. Right, well, well uh, <laughs> so the question then is, what are you using the prediction for? Um, you know, if you're thinking about, uh, you know, buying a winter coat uh, in six months, it's actually very useful. If you're trying to figure out whether to hold a party on a given day, maybe not so much. So getting back to the, uh, the question that was asked about democracy in China, I would argue that it's very difficult to predict uh, that event in any degree of precision for a given year or two. But over the course of 10, 20, 30 years, I actually think it's possible to predict that with a reasonable degree of accuracy, including, you know, what's going on with the Arab Spring. And it, it's not so much just the middle class, although that's part of it. I think that, James, maybe um, you know, your, your focus is different from mine because um, you know, I'm focusing on the incentive structure. The middle class uh, is not what gave rise to democracy, but rather it's the other way around. The, the democracy created a middle class. And what's driving it, in my view, is the fact that capitalism in its purest form, communism in its purest form, both of those forms of government are economically unsustainable. They lead to certain inefficiencies and breakdowns that really can't be tolerated. And so as you get to an extreme, ultimately you're gonna have a phase transition. So I think you could have seen, and people did see, certain phase transitions coming, but you can't predict it to the, the, the year or the day or the month unless you actually have better and better data. Maybe with, if everybody were forced to use Facebook, Twitter, and all of these other methods, we could actually do that. I would, I would actually that. be concerned, in fact, for, for if the, the Chinese government will force to use everybody to use Facebook and Twitter, and we'll be monitoring the friends and the friends and the friends of friends so closely they'll know exactly whom to eliminate when they start to try to institute yeah. democracy. <laughs> but what, what, I'm not well, well yeah, how would you, if you move that question to, to uh, communism or Castro in Cuba, mm -hmm. you're welcome, P predicting that, is it a much more difficult question to predict? And why would that be? It's not science. Sure. I, I, don't, I don't know what we're talking about. I, I really feel like we're just, <laughs> it, it, th this feels to me like, you know, I mean, it's very interesting to talk about, and maybe it's fine and we could go on, but, but I think we're kidding ourselves. Steve, I have to disagree. And the reason why I, I do is because it's possible to phrase this in terms of a testable hypothesis, okay. which is exactly what, what you do in, in any other science. So hypothesis, an increase in middle class makes democracy more likely. So An increase in democracy makes the middle class grow. Those right. are two testable hypotheses. That's fine yeah. at the level of, you know, the large sample of looking at different countries around the world. But what if something happens in North Korea that, that we're not talking about because it's a black swan or Pakistan decides to do some weird thing? Right. I mean, these are, this is how history is going to look when we're looking back 50 or 100 or, or 500 years from now if we're still here. And, you know, they'll, like that crazy thing that started World War I, whatever it is that they're still arguing about. You know, some people say, well, oh, of course you could see it coming. All right. I, okay, I, let's no, not go on. We're going to be the in the pit no. here. No, yeah. <laughs> well, I think we have time for one more question. Let me go to here. Hello, I'm Kyle Dunton from Morton Beach, Florida. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, earlier, in panel, <laughs> earlier in the panel, earlier in the panel, earlier in the panel, you mentioned a case involving Target and that pregnant daughter. Now, could you please elaborate on marketing, uh, uh, mathematics and marketing, but this time on the level of demographics to certain areas, at, and the planet at least? Yeah, so demographics are, are, are going to be less and less useful now that we have the social context. Um, for a wide variety of different prediction problems, so you can do a better job of predicting a person's behavior by knowing their friend's behavior than by knowing their age or their sex or, or any of the other traditional um, demographic factors that, that we typically use. So Nielsen has been very responsible for promoting this view of, oh, well, if you have a TV show, um, it's going to appeal to 25 to 32-year-old women um, who are stay-at-home moms, right? So, and, and political campaigns think this way as well. You don't have to think that way anymore because we all live in our own tribes that are unique, that are defined now by these social connections. And if you have access to that data, you can get specialized predictions for every single person. You don't need to know these more generic things about them in order to be able to make predictions that are just as accurate as we have from, from these traditional categories. By the way, it's probably a useful thing to point out that the reason Target has all of that data, that they're able to make these incredibly useful predictions, 
is because all of you use your Target discount card, and every time you swipe that discount card and you buy things, they can actually correlate that with your demographics. So I think ultimately, we give up data, not because we want to, not because we feel that it's good, but because we actually get <coughs> compensated to do so. Okay, we'll talk more about this on Science Friday. Well, I want to thank all of you. <laughs> thank you.